this week, Siskel and Ebert review Tim Robbins undergoing sinister hallucinations in Jacob's Ladder. Robert Altman explores the tortured lives of Van Gogh and his brother in Vincent and Theo. And Peter Falk plays Cupid to Keanu Reeves and Barbara Hershey in Tune In Tomorrow. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert. is a Vietnam veteran whose life turns into hell on earth in Jacob's Ladder, one of the new movies we're going to be reviewing this week. And also on this program, we'll do an update on Robert Altman, one of the top American directors of the 1970s. What do his changing fortunes have to say about the American film industry? I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Jacob's Ladder, and this is a mostly mesmerizing thriller, only disappointing at the end. It's about a Vietnam veteran whose horrible hallucinations make him wonder if he's living in hell or whether the terrible visions he's been having are the result of some perverse army experiment. Tim Robbins, so good as the wild rookie pitcher in Bull Durham, plays the vet who looks like a strung-out David Letterman. One of his nightmare visions occurs in the New York subway system where he thinks he's under attack by ghoulies on a train. <laughs> Domestically, his life is also in turmoil. His marriage has fallen apart. He's living with a girlfriend played by Elizabeth Pena. She doesn't want him to answer a call from another Vietnam vet who lays blame for the nightmares he's been having on the army. Who was that? Part of a chemical warfare unit out of Saigon. I knew something was going on. Pursuing the army plot theory, Jacob and his buddies hire a lawyer to press their case, but the attorney ends up getting nowhere but angry. Jason Alexander, a very solid supporting actor, plays the attorney. That's right. I checked with the army's bureau of information. You never even went to Vietnam. What's that supposed to mean? It means that you and your friends are wacko. You're all discharged on psychological grounds after some war games in Thailand. And the whole film is played at that level of intensity. At times, especially in its resolution, Jacob's Ladder is a frustrating picture to watch, raising so many questions about what's going on here. But in its elaborate setup, the first hour and a half of the picture, it's really quite compelling because the lead players, Tim Robbins and Elizabeth Pena, the girlfriend, anchor the madness and create a real and gutsy and loving relationship together. Director Adrian Lin has a better eye, I think, for individual shots than for a whole narrative. But I found the journey of Jacob Singer worth taking. In other words, you wanted the ending to be more simple-minded. I'd like the ending to be um, maybe less complicated than it is because I think the story is fascinating. Gene, I think the ending is transparently clear in what it's trying to say. And I, I think I like this movie as much as you do, but I think I like it for what's there on the screen, whereas you seem to criticize the very strengths of the movie. This is a portrait of a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. He is living in a world in which he has no idea what is real and what isn't real. Right. At the end, he and we find out something that makes everything before fall into place, and that's the part you don't like. Uh, the way it falls into place is what I don't like in the picture. Uh, I think that the picture is very strong in presenting that world. I think it was pretty easy to guess what was going on. I had no trouble guessing it, and I guess I thought that uh, if they had made the explanation, there's some red herrings thrown in this piece that I thought it's just overflowing. Well, the red herrings are thrown in by the character himself. Right. If you, and I don't want to give the plot away, but the fact is that everything in this movie comes out of his mind in one way or another. Right. And the fact is that at the end, I enjoyed the fact that I was being challenged to think and to right. retrospectively figure out what was going on during the entire movie. I don't want it to be simple. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be one of those canned mm -hmm. Hollywood endings where everything is all tied up in a neat bow. The challenging thing about this movie 
movie is that it really takes you into this mental state right. and makes you occupy that state along with the character. Yeah, and I don't know what you're so uh, angry about because I enjoyed this film very, very yeah, much. Yeah, but you enjoyed it and yet you criticized the best parts of it. As I don't if you think wanted them, they, were, only... they should have been more clear. Or they, they were too convoluted. Uh, well, actually the latter. Well, yeah. okay. Our next movie is a gentle and goofy little fable called Waiting for the Light about a lot of characters who are so colorful and eccentric and off the wall that they could only come from a screenwriter's imagination. If life were like this, Norman Rockwell would have been out of work. The movie stars Shirley MacLaine as a retired magician who now spends most of her time teaching her niece's children magic tricks, often with unpredictable results. The only sane person in the family is MacLaine's niece, played by Terry Garr. When her uncle dies, she inherits a rundown diner out in the West and decides to start a new life for her family. But McLean makes quite an impression on the local minister. A grouchy old man lives next door, so McLean and the kids decide to play a trick on him, but it backfires when he thinks he sees an angel in a treetop, and it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the Light is one of those movies about people who are so lovable and colorful and goofy that you want them to dial down a little. Everything in this movie is relentlessly nice, even the kids with their practical jokes. If the movie had been just a little more mean-spirited and cynical, it actually might have been more fun, but this kind of lightweight whimsy goes a real long way. That was exactly my reaction. Uh, you have two actresses who are very good at playing uh, real characters, particularly Carrie Garr, who is one of the most natural performers, I think, around. and. They're they're forced into this really cutesy pie story. Yeah. All the stuff out with with the little kids and with the uh, this Vincent Schiavelli, who I guess is from Ghost, the monster, or the, the old man there. Mm -hmm. uh, it just seems completely phony and not of a piece. If they had played it, as you say, a little tougher mm -hmm. in some way, it would have worked. It's all just kind of like pointless sweetness. Right. And everybody a is a bit character. Of, everybody's Next. a character, and so what? Coming up, Robert Altman's Vincent and Theo, the story of Vincent Van Gogh and his brother in their final years. And also, tune in tomorrow on Offbeat Comedy with Peter Falk and Barbara Hershey. Okay, gang, take five. When I'm 50, you're going to be 35. Well, what are you going to do when I, when I get my hot flashes and my mood swings? Huh? What are you going to do? Keanu Reeves and Barbara Hershey discussing their May-December relationship in our next film, which is a thoroughly entertaining, thoroughly original comedy called Tune In Tomorrow. It stars Peter Falk as a successful soap opera writer hired by a foundering New Orleans radio station to boost its ratings. His method is to adapt the real scandalous lives of the people around him, including Keanu Reeves as a young news writer at the radio station and Barbara Hershey as Reeves' aunt, who he has a crush on. That's really sweet of... Oh, no. Meanwhile, at the radio station, Peter Falk implores his actors to goose up their tired performance style. The key to your part, Leonard, is you're in love, got it? Madly in love. You're in love so bad you can taste it in your mouth. Yeah, that's what I'm feeling. But I ain't hearing it, Len. It ain't coming across the airwaves, know what I mean? The radio soap opera is outrageous and quite funny, as in this scene, with a doctor, John Larroquette, inducing childbirth in Elizabeth McGovern. Uncle Albert is trying to induce me even though I'm only four months pregnant. You, you keep your filthy hands off her, you gynecologist. This is madness. Pretty funny stuff. Tune in tomorrow is based on a novel by Mario Vargas Losa who recently ran for the presidency of Peru, and the film honors his reputation for adventurous writing. All of the principal players are effective, as Tune In Tomorrow turns out to be one of those movies you've been waiting for, if you like your movies, to be brash and witty and romantic and even sometimes vulgar. I liked it a lot. I didn't like it as much as you did. Uh, it seemed to me that the soap opera stuff wasn't fully uh, worked into the rest of the plot, and one of the things that bothered me 
uh, that I should have liked was all of the references to perverted Albanian milkmaids. Uh, in the original novel by Losa, he was attacking Bolivians, and in Peru that would be a joke. But in America, I don't think Albanians are quite such a joke. Maybe if they'd made them perverted Canadian milkmaids, it would have worked better. What I do don't think, think it would have made any difference no. whatsoever. It is so... Uh, constant in knocking this one group uh -huh. that I think that even members of that group would have to admit at some point it's very funny. That, uh, that isn't a criticism that seems to be valid at all. I, I think that it's out. The film is surprisingly funny that we always want characters to talk as uh, wickedly as funny as the best mm -hmm. jokes we hear in, in, uh, on the street and, and this picture is at that level. It's very well, funny. Well, I, you know, I just, I don't know, I had some fondness for it. I, I like Peter Falk's work. Uh, there were some times when I laughed and yet it didn't just go over the top for me. There are two stories they're trying to tell. One is the, the soap opera thing and then well, the other relationship. I think neither story quite went over the top for me. No painter in the last century has been more intriguing than the brilliant, tortured Vincent Van Gogh. And when we come back, we'll review Robert Altman's new film about Vincent and his brother, Theo. <laughs> What everybody knows about the painter Vincent Van Gogh is that he cut off his ear. What everybody doesn't know is that this tortured genius, whose paintings are currently selling for tens of millions of dollars and setting auction records, only sold a single painting during his lifetime. Hardly anybody believed in his talent except for his brother Theo, and theirs was not an easy relationship. In Robert Altman's new film, Vincent and Theo, Van Gogh attacks his brother for not doing a better job of promoting him. And don't you tell me there's no market for my work. It's your job to make a market. If you can sell Toro, you can damn well sell me. Vincent is played by Tim Roth as a complicated man who seems strangely naive about the ways of the world. Paul Rees plays Theo, who is not happy in a gallery job because his employers don't recognize Vincent's genius. Well, it's a slightly different market, of course. We think any new brand should concentrate on paintings given your special interest in that area? It would be an experiment. Uh, are, are you saying that I could run my own gallery? For Van Gogh, painting and living were so closely entwined that sometimes he could not tell one from the other. Vincent and Theo is one of the best films I've seen about art and the complexities and tortures of creating it. Van Gogh is portrayed here as a man at the mercy of his gift, a man who paints because he must and suffers and dies because his painting drives all sensible precautions right out of his life. The character of Theo Van Gogh is often lost in his brother's shadow, but here Robert Altman shows how the two brothers, in a way, make up one complete man. Vincent, compelled to paint, and Theo, equally obsessed by the need to find an audience for those paintings that no one cared about. This is a passionate film about two very different but very passionate men. Well, and I think that that's the special quality of this picture is focusing on the brothers' relationship. Also, other characters who come in to play here and are very well known in Van Gogh's life and through the paintings are Gauguin and also Dr. Gachet, the painting that uh, was just acquired at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, are, are really made to come alive here. So it, it seems like a, a very real world and not... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it's possible to make a bad painting about, a bad film about Van Gogh, because we've had uh, Paul Cox's Vincent, which was mm -hmm. superb, and we were talking as rapturously about that. You yeah. get to see these and great... Vincent, Vincent, Vincent Minnelli's movie, Lust for Life, You also. get to see the Van Gogh paintings, which is all, yeah. are always great, even if they're copies, and uh, it, it's what, one of the great lives. What Altman does here is something that Scorsese also did in New York Stories in his vignette about painting, and that is he makes a real connection between the emotional state of the painter right. and what's going on to the canvas. Again, the way this picture has been shot, Jean Lapine is the uh, cinematographer, mm -hmm. get a lot of credit, the shots inside Van Gogh's quarters with uh, the prostitute that he hires, uh, the, the way he can relate to a woman, it, it's really an exceptional film. Looking ahead now, a special report on director Robert Altman, who made this film. Fifteen years ago, he was atop the world of cinema. What made him lose that position? That's coming up next.
through his latest film, Vincent and Theo, which we just reviewed, he's insisted on expressing a distinctly personal vision. And in the 70s, that made him one of the hottest directors around, but not in the 1980s. Indeed, when Vincent and Theo premiered at the Toronto Film Festival last month, one Toronto paper referred to it as his first film in 10 years. They were overlooking TV movies, a TV series, and eight theatrical films, but that slip was very revealing. I imagine that a lot of people who don't really follow films think of you as somebody who has been inactive for a while. How does that make you feel? Well, I don't think about it very much. Uh, it, it depresses me a little bit that, uh, that my worth is gauged on that, those scales. Mm -hmm. But whose isn't? Allman's first big hit was M.A.S.H., which made stars out of Elliot Gould and Donald Sutherland. I think you will find these accommodating. They're quite dry. Don't you use olives? The elegiac western McCabe and Mrs. Miller was an unforgettable collaboration with Warren Beatty and Julie Christie. Yeah. Nashville won five Academy Award nominations, including those for Best Picture and Best Director, and it's considered one of the best films of modern times. But in the 80s, as his personal style fell out of favor, Altman shifted gears from big-budget Hollywood productions to smaller, more venturesome films like Secret Honor, a one-man soliloquy showing Richard Nixon agonizing over Watergate. Watergate was nothing more than uh, a misdemeanor copying a plea, a third-rate burglary. And Fool for Love, starring playwright Sam Shepard and Kim Bassinger in a version of Shepard's play. To a lot of people, it looked like Altman's career was in decline in the 1980s but not to Robert Altman. I run into people today and they say, oh, God, I love your new pictures. It's great. Has, has it been just terrible for you since, uh, you, you know, since when Popeye failed? Mm -hmm. And I read in the paper today in a review, saying uh, after many miscues, and they keep saying Popeye was such a failure. Popeye was no failure. Uh, Popeye made a lot of money. Yeah, and it was not perceived by me as a failure in any sense. I mean, I think it was a wonderful film, but at the time, the press generally was that Popeye didn't, wasn't Superman. It didn't make do the numbers as Superman. Thanks. Thanks. Today, uh, if a film isn't in the top five, ten, uh, people don't even know it's there. The notion of personal filmmaking seems to have died out. Well, they're not marketed, and they don't even get through the cracks. The news services, the main newspapers, especially the television, they sit and support the market value of these films. My feeling is if I come up and say, hey, I want to do this film about this one guy sitting in this room, and it's not going to cost very much, nobody, I had to finance that Nixon film myself. Roberto, would you erase all that crap, please? In the 70s, though, and in the 60s, they also had big studio releases, and yet at the same time, audiences seemed more aware of art films. That's because the, at that time, when you were starting, the critics at that time were pushing that end of it. In other words, the, you, you, you people made that possible. The, the media makes a great deal of difference in how they approach films. The hype has come along. The, the, all this stuff that usually you read about films that's in the uh, entertainment section should be on the business page. There's no room for smaller films. Unfortunately, there's a lot of truth in what he says. Uh, we've enjoyed his films like Secret Honor and Fool for Love right. and Five and Dime uh, over the last 10 years, but unless a movie has a 10 or 20 million dollar advertising budget these days, it's real hard for it to find a, a, a hearing. I don't think that critics are the big problem that he's saying right now. Some of the, the media, the entertainment media, you know, keeps pushing the top five grossing films every week and all that. We don't do that. We critics are still interested in his work when it's very good. I put Secret Honor on the, to my 10 best list. Mm -hmm. We'll review him here. Uh, he ran into having some pictures like the Paul Newman uh, film Quintet not doing any business at all, and so he was considered box office poison out in Hollywood. 
but that's much more, I think, what happened to him. Uh, and I don't think the studios are interested in his quality kinds of pictures, the personal film as much, and that's their problem. Although the point is, I think that Robert Altman has not gone away. Robert right. Altman is still making good movies, and whether or not millions of people are going to them or not, he has nothing yes. that he has to feel bad about when he looks at this. No, if, if anybody wants a film to run of his in the last decade, I would say Secret Honor is the one. Philip Baker Hall, I believe, is the actor who plays it's Nixon. A great performance. Great film. Coming up next, another fine movie, now on home video, that may become a holiday classic. The holiday family drama Prancer, made last year, is coming out on home video this next week. And this is definitely a film to rent, telling the fanciful story of a little girl who believes that a wild reindeer in her town is actually one of Santa's reindeer. And the reindeer is missing and Santa better find him. When it's caged up as a neighborhood store's promotional stunt, the young girl, with her brother, tries to liberate the reindeer prancer. It's prancer, Steve. May we get to see him fly? This is a movie that also provides a strong look at small town life. It's not just a kiddie show. It's full of honest adult characters, too. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Jacob's Ladder, the psychological thriller about a Vietnam vet. I liked everything but the way the film resolves itself. Roger disagreed violently. He thinks it all works. Two thumbs down for Waiting for the Light, with Shirley MacLaine and Terry Garr playing much too cutesy characters. A split vote on the offbeat comedy Tune In Tomorrow. I enjoyed the soap opera parody. Roger had only scattered laughs. And two thumbs up for Robert Altman's Vincent and Theo, focusing on the relationship between Vincent Van Gogh and his older brother. So two films we're both recommending. Jacob's Jake. Ladder and Vincent and, and Theo. And Vincent and Theo, which is rolling out across the country, uh, big city stores. I also think Tune In Tomorrow is a film that dares to be different. Okay, that's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with Dances with Wolves, starring Kevin Costner as a Civil War officer adopted by an Indian tribe. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. Thank you.